Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through His life-giving Word. And my prayer is this will help you to know Him or to know Him better. Enjoy following along. Good morning. Our first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you, when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them, bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading this morning is from Titus chapter 2 and reading from the first verse. And uh, this is Paul writing to his colleague Titus. And he says, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about you. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is actually um, a privilege to be here because this is our third attempt to get here in the last year, thanks to Melbourne lockdowns. We had two other trips planned and then suddenly Melbourne closed its borders. I think we became famous globally for being the most, one of the most locked down cities. But Christine and I survived. We're a testament that you can get through these things and hopefully we became better people as a result. Um, this morning, obviously we're calling this title of this, this message, uh, Godliness in Home Life. Don't be put off by home life. You may think that, you know, you don't, that applies to just families, but in this text it really applies to all of us, as we'll soon see. And really the, the whole theme behind this passage is how um, we, can, we have this undeserved grace from God that he has given us. There's nothing that we can do to earn it to earn our salvation. And as we apply some of these principles and teaching that, that um, Paul gives Titus, we can actually see our households grow in godliness. So that's, that's the, uh, the big idea. So Paul starts off with talking about um, trustworthy teaching, the context of his audience, which is always important to understand when we're looking at passages 
from Scripture is that the Cretan church where Titus had, had been left behind, basically, uh, Paul was traveling, doing missionary work, Titus was with him, he leaves him in Crete. But in Crete, um, we know from the context in chapter 1 that there was a lot of influence of false teachers. And they were misleading and undermining the, the Christians who were probably quite new in their faith, young in their faith. Um, when I think of that context, I think of Melbourne. I think of Melbourne in the pandemic. I think of all the false information that was spreading around the community. And I think of my own church being undermined by that. Um, just these stories that were half true of what was really going on, who you could trust and who you can't, couldn't trust. And so it kind of helps me picture this challenge that Paul is giving Titus when he says you must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. I don't know about you, but growing up, when I heard the word doctrine, I was often put off. You know, that's for theologians who go to seminary. And the rest of us, we don't need to worry a whole lot about doctrine. Well, we actually do, according to Paul. But what, it, what is he actually talking about? In, in, this pass, in this opening of this passage, we get the idea that the first responsibility of home life is to, prov is to promote the kind of living or wholesome living, wholesome teaching, um, communicating behavior uh, that speaks, or even speaking out on these things. These are different translations in English that, that give this, this idea. But what is being communicated? The sound doctrine is actually sound tr teaching. It's true. You, it's not corrupt because it comes from the Lord Jesus. And its basis is the Bible. It's not made up by the latest uh, heresies or the latest gossip, whatever. It, it is, can be trusted. And this is what Paul is, is really elaborating. And it is in the flavor of what Jesus said to his own disciples. His last words to them were to obey everything that Jesus commanded of them. This sound doctrine is to have a noticeable influence in our lives. So think of doctrine, sound doctrine as sound teaching, good principles, godly principles that help our home life improve. But it's really this other aspect that we see is it's countering deception. It's countering these other voices. It's countering messages that aren't quite right. They sound convincing. Often cults start this way, don't they? They, they're very close to the truth, but then they add a few things, and they start leading us away into ways that are not very helpful. Chris Wright, a theologian from the United Kingdom, calls the Word of God the perfect missionary. You can't get a more perfect missionary than the Bible. Obviously, the Gideons believe that, don't they? They put a Bible in hotel rooms all around the world. Um, you, some, these days, hotels now remove those so they don't create a fence. But the vision of this idea that people, if they can just have access to God's word, it's actually perfect. It's a perfect message. We don't always understand it. Otherwise, we wouldn't come to church and hear messages to help us explain and learn. We could just read the Bible and get all we need to know. But the Bible, of course, is, is in a sense such a complex but simple message that we often need so much reminder. And this is actually the vision, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier about Wycliffe, is that if the word is available to people, they at least have a source, an authoritative source to go to. They may not always understand it, and by being in their own language, and hopefully if they've had some literacy and some aids to help them, they can then uh, understand the basics or the truth. One of the challenges in, in the world, and I don't want to make this real complex, but with our major languages like English, Spanish, French, they are also uh, languages of colonialism. We've just lost uh, Queen Elizabeth. The British Empire has been uh, talked about a lot. A lot of people have problems with it because of its co colonial era, which is unfortunate as well because it was probably did some good things. But when we are working in these other language groups, these minority groups that have had minimal contact with the Western world, and we bring in the scripture in English, it's very easy for that to be a colonizing effect because it's seen as something foreign rather than something local. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Sung Chan Kwan from Korea, talks about why Christian, local Christians need to self-theologize. In other words, 
They need to take the, the truth of the gospel and learn to apply it to their context because their context is going to be different. The Korean context is totally different to the Australian context. I just came from Korea a week ago, and it's so different and yet so westernized at a, at a superficial level. This idea of digging deeper and applying uh, scripture to the local context is, is what we call in, in mission self-theologizing. But that's actually what Paul has done. He has looked at this context of Crete, and he's given some instruction for godly living, and he's giving this to Titus. And the way he does this is he has five groups of people. And then he gives some specific instruction to each of these groups that if they follow these instructions, they're going to have a much better, much deeper family life, uh, and it's going to be godly. And so the first group is the older men. And looking around the room, I can see that we're well represented in the room. That's not a bad thing at all. However, you may think we can kind of relax as older men. You know, we kind of reach that point in life where we can kind of just, just take it easy. But that's not how Paul sees it. He's got some pretty tough words to say. Be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, love and endurance. Why does he say this? I think behind this, he knows that older men are easily, um, uh, what, offended when younger men say things to them or correct them. You've, you've got that in your own family if you've got kids and they're correcting you as a parent, which my, ki my adult kids will do from time to time. Um, we are easily offended sometimes that somebody would try to correct us. But in many cultures also, uh, older men can kind of be seen as untouchable. They have uh, so high up in society that the rules don't apply to them anymore. And when you live that way, this, 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 uh, this arrogance can be quite a problem. In some cultures, um, like in Africa and other places, that can be quite a challenge. Paul is also getting at that as you age, don't become passive, waiting around to the end of your life, kind of not really having any meaning to it. My father, um, my, my mother passed away right as the pandemic was kicking in. She had a heart issue suddenly. I couldn't go see her, couldn't be at her memorial, anything like that, because of our closed borders. But my father had to work through that. They were very close, a uh, couple, and at eight, he's 89 now, and I've watched him actually live out this challenge. Rather than saying to the Lord, I wish you would take me too. I want to be with you and where, where my mother, where his wife Joyce is, to, you know what, I still have work to do here on earth, even though I'm an old man. I can invest in my grandchildren and other things like that. So this is very much the spirit that Paul is saying. Older men, you still have a contribution to make. Don't give up on that. Keep going in your faith. Older women are not off the hook either. I'm sorry to say this. In fact, I'd say they're actually given an even bigger challenge because, first of all, they're told how they're meant to live. They're not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine. I'm sure none of that applies to anyone here. But they were also, in their context, often objects of ridicule. They were mocked for gossip and foolish talk. So that's what they were known for. Again, I, I'm sure we're not talking about anyone here but that was certainly the context. They were meant to do what was right, and, and through their right living, they were actually becoming a role model. But who were they becoming a role model to? They were actually becoming a role model to younger women. Um, younger women are not so well represented in this service. I'm sure they are in some of the other ones uh, coming, but it was customary for older women to instruct the younger women as daughters, it's all through the scripture. It's very biblical principle. And so Paul is um, explaining to how the older women are role models to the younger women so that the younger women know how to conduct family life. And of course, in this culture of the time, the women, I'm sure, were not working in jobs and all like we would in our modern world. And so they had more time at home. And the idea was that they would uh, make home life beautiful however that would look for them, and that was their challenge. And then younger men, and younger men are given quite a bit of advice, and I would underscore that the main piece of advice, be self-controlled. 
I don't know about you in, in here, in, but if, if we're driving in Melbourne and it's a dangerous road and a pea plater passes us, it will be a young man, usually a tradesman in a ute with a pea plate. And there's just this idea that we're indestructible when we're young men. Self-control seems to be so important uh, for young men. However, it's important for all of us, isn't it? Because we're all role modeling all the time. We're being watched all the time. If the younger people are sick of church and Christianity, it's probably a lot to do with what they see in us. Um, so we have the role to play in this. The next one, the fifth group, is a little trickier. Um, there's different ways of translating this. Bond servant is, is kind of the main idea here. A bond servant is a, someone who agrees to be a slave for financial reasons. They need the income. And Paul is not in any way condoning slavery because otherwise where in scripture he is not for slavery at all, but he's talking about a context. This was a culturally appropriate or acceptable context that there would be bond servants as slaves working in these households and they were to behave a certain way, particularly if they claimed to be Christians. I was wondering if slavery is still a problem in the world today. I'm sure you know it is. The International Labor Organization says there are 50 million people living in some form of slavery today, half in arranged marriages and half in forced labor, roughly. And about 16 million in Asia Pacific, so our part of the world. Probably even here in Australia, especially with forms of exploitation and arranged marriages. And so it's not like it doesn't exist. We may not encounter it face to face, but it is going on. And the challenge for those people who are in that situation, who are Christians, is that they are meant to behave in such a way that honors the Lord rather than making it difficult for the person who's in charge of them. I find that incredibly difficult to get my head around that a person who's in slavery is meant to be well behaved to their, to their masters uh, who are meant to be Christians. It's not our context, but this idea of role modeling Faithfulness, godliness flows all the way through these five groups of people. And all that leads to is a God-filled life. That's the, where this is all going as Paul finishes up this passage. He's giving advice for how to live relationships in the home. We're all part of home life in some way or another. Uh, if, we don't, if all of our relatives are, are gone now, we are still part of a church, and that's a family, a community for us as well that we behave in. And Paul is concerned that all these requirements uh, could become rules for these five groups. They could become very onerous, very burdensome, and so he tries to alleviate that and kind of reduce that problem and say, well, all you're giving us is this set of rules. In fact, he's trying to inspire us about, the, about what is in store for us through the grace of God. Verse 14, he says, we strive to be Jesus' very own people who are eager to follow his example and do good works, is the idea. Because we are Christians, because we are followers of Christ, we want to do what's good. We want to do what's right because we know that honors him. We know he's watching us, even if no one else knows we're a believer, he knows. He knows how we treat our neighbor. He knows how we treat each other. And the whole idea is we want to be God's very own and we want to be his example in our society. Verse 12, we should be done with the things in life which are offensive or dishonorable to God. Even in our own older age as we age, we can still do incredibly offensive things to God, can't we? It's not hard to do. In fact, it might even be easier at times because we just have age and maturity and, and status. Again, in Korea, I was amazed at what older pastors, senior pastors get away with because of the society structure. I mean, they have so much authority. They do good things, but they can wield a lot of authority as well. And then thirdly, this challenge that Paul gives is that when circumstances do overwhelm us, as they do, we can take comfort in waiting for a wonderful event that's still to happen. Either we're going to go join Christ because he takes us uh, through illness or old age, or he's going, he's, we're waiting expectantly for his return. And we're never to lose sight of that. So easy to, but we're never to lose sight that that's what we're, we're, we have that future hope. All of this leads to then a transforming 
experience a transforming process, a transformation that should be happening, happening within us. If we live these values, people should actually see something's different in us. The sad thing is that that's not always the case. Uh, a number of years ago, I, I used to be the leader of Wycliffe Global Alliance, which is a, a movement of 100 other organizations with, within Wycliffe, and I had the global responsibility to lead that up until 2020 when I stepped down after 12 years. But early on, I had to deal with a situation in a country in Europe, a Western country, part of the European Union, where we discovered that the director of that organization and his wife had embezzled 140,000 euros, which is probably around $200,000. And that money was the missionaries' money of that agency. Wycliffe missionaries in other parts of the world, it was their money that he was siphoning off. And when we caught him, or when his board caught him, it was funny how, not funny, but sad how he justified it. You know, he had, he had financial needs, he wasn't well compensated. So he set up, he was an accountant, and set up eight accounts in his wife's name and siphoned off this money through his wife, so she was complicit. So that is not a story of transformation. These are missionaries. They played the system. They got caught out. They got fired. They pop up later in another mission agency, and who knows what they're doing. This is the European Union, where you have all these laws stopping this kind of nonsense. On the other side of it, I came across a man, Pedro Hernandez in Mexico. He was telling us uh, when we were visiting, he, he's in the northern Sierra part of the Puebla state, sort of outside of Mexico City, a couple hour drive. He was talking about what happened in his community that didn't have the scriptures in their own language. They only had it in Spanish. They didn't really like Spanish. It was the language of the conquerors. But some translation effort had taken place in the Nahatol language, one of the dialects. And a few years later, looking back, he talked about how the power of God touched the men in the community. They were drunks. They beat up their wives. They were lawless. They were into witchcraft and murder. And God started transforming them couple by couple, male by male, family by family, so that the whole community was transformed. That's what this is about, not the case in Europe where we've been a Christian for so long we can figure out how to bend the rules and get away with things. Instead, we see a community that's not encountered the gospel before, encountering and say, you know what, I'm done with witchcraft, I'm done with drunkenness and family violence, this is not honoring to God. Whatever a transformation looks like, I submit to you, it looks like that, not like the European case. And let me close with this, this final challenge that I think we get from this, this passage. Paul is emphasizing teaching and observing sound doctrine or sound wise teaching from scripture. He's emphasizing this. We have to be reminded of this, of its importance. We need to recapture the wonderness and preciousness of biblical truth. And it's an invitation to know Jesus at a deeper level. Sure, Paul applies this to his context. He self-theologizes, even for slaves and bond servants, what this looks like for them. We've got to do the same thing in our post-Christian Australian uh, society. I, you're probably not as post-Christian here as we are in Melbourne, but we face, we face that hostility. As God's people, though, he calls us to be a contrast community. We're not meant to look like the rest of society. We are actually meant to look different because we behave differently, because we follow a different teaching. It doesn't mean we're so in our, everyone's face bashing them with the Bible, but when they see us, they see something is different, even if they can't pinpoint what that is. And I would sum it this way as the Psalmist David says from Psalm 43, and I'll close it this way. Psalmist David says, He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. May that be our lives as well, that we have that new song in our lives. People see it, hear it, see God working in us, and they eventually want to put their trust in him. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we can learn from this passage that Paul has 
eloquently written to his um, understudy, Titus. And now we ask you to help apply it to our own lives. Our behaviors that may not be honoring to you, we may not live for you the way we should. We may be discouraged and need some encouragement. Whatever our situation is with you, I pray you will speak to us this morning, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Kirk. Um, God's Word does transform our lives, doesn't it? It's lovely to hear that last story of, of those men who've put aside alcohol and witchcraft and being violent towards their women. May the Lord work here in Tamworth in that way through His Word that we'd see more lives transform. Speaking of lives transform, we had a, a group go out to Walgett. And I think Daphne was on that group uh, for a kids club. Uh, so Jum and a, a team of 13 or 14 or so went out to see George and, um, and uh, Carmel Ferguson. And well, there were around about what, 40 to 60 kids over the three-day program. Um, and so they heard the gospel. We can be praying that their lives might be transformed as well. Thank you, Kirk, for bringing the message this morning. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for Him, and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in Him. And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in any time at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. is kind of more traditional service, 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. We have children's programs or 6 p.m. in the evening. That's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong, which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791, or you can use the QR code, which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.